Good morning, Cornerstone family and friends. Great to have you with us this morning. Trust that you've had a great week. I can't believe that it's already the end of uh, November here. Around the corner, we're going to be entering into December. Typically our happy holiday, Christmas time of the year, all those kind of wonderful things that are going on. Throngs of people have been going through Black Friday online, even in person, all across North America. And uh, yeah, here we are, end of November already. This morning, I want to talk to you about building on the same topic of building you, our series. And today's topic is beyond uncertainty. One of the things we've watched in our world is just um, a lot of things are at a place where we don't have any certainty on some areas. And uh, we're grasping, hoping, desiring things to change. But that time of uncertainty is often a very stressful and um, can be a very complicated time in our lives. There's an uncertainty with regards to our economy, the politics, the employment, the finances, relationships, our physical health and well-being, mental health, concerns that really address our safety, our well-being, and a sense of control over our lives. And without that, a lot of times we struggle in the arena of fear. There's some tips to cope with uncertainty that uh, Lawrence Robinson and Melinda Smith in their article of dealing with uncertainty during coronavirus pandemic had written in April 2020. They said, tip one, focus on controlling things in your control. Secondly, challenge your need for certainty, which really comes down to worrying. When you're excessively seeking assurances from others or you begin to micromanage others, um, you procrastinate or you're double checking relentlessly. When you're getting in that place of needing to have that certainty, it can be, it can drive a person around the bend. Thirdly, learn to tolerate uncertainty in life. You know, a lot of times we have some irrational fears that come into our minds or worries, what ifs, what could happen. And we need to choose how to identify what triggers uh, happen in our life and how to avoid or reduce their impact. We want to really identify that the fact is we're, we're wanting assurance in our life is really what we're looking for. Fourthly, observe your, observe your feelings and, and try to stay in the present instead of that arena of what ifs. Let go of trying to tell the future, basically. You know, nobody has that kind of control in most cases. We, we have certain things that we can arrange and direct in order to hopefully have the accomplished goal or the focus. But there's a lot of things in life that we really have no control over. One of the things we can do is just uh, reduce that by taking the time to put our attention to the things that we are present with, what we are able to do. Meditate, take time for a walk, and the fifth thing that they suggest to reduce your anxiety and stress by acknowledging the fact that you have emotions and your emotions need to be dealt with honestly. There's times that you need to address, well, yes, I'm upset or I'm fearful. And instead of just letting that worry and build in you, figure out ways of which you can actually reduce it in your life. Maybe taking time to relax, taking some deep breathing exercises, sleep, a healthy diet, all those can contribute to a, a better scenario in your life came across this. A well-dressed city slicker breaks down on a country road. His cell phone is dead, but a kindly farmer tells him he can use a landline in his farmhouse a few hundred yards back from the road. The traveler strides hurriedly across the field, farmer's field in advance of the farmer, but hesitates as he draws near a broad body of water. And he turns back to look at the farmer with some, some uncertainty. Carry on, calls the farmer. It ain't deep. Being in a hurry, the traveler does not concern himself about his shoes and socks, but slightly raises the bottoms of his trousers and charges forward rapidly. But immediately upon first placing a foot in the shallow pool, he realizes with horror that he has been deceived. He plummets headlong into what is actually a very deep pond. And all of a sudden, he finds himself completely submerged, flailing his arms and legs round wildly. His feet don't even reach the bottom. He rises to the surface, sputtering and slapping the surface of the water with his hands. He turns around and hauls himself out of the water, instantly turning the dusty ground into mud, which proceeds to stain his expensive suit. He finds he has slimy weeds wrapped around his limbs and his tie and, and is entangled in his cufflinks. He's a complete mess. He stands up. He glares at the farmer. Hey, farmer, says, I thought you said the puddle isn't deep. Well, says the farmer, wincing and with a guilty look, he, I thought you said the, I, well, well, now you see the thing is, he says, he raises his hand to a mark across the chest. 
it only came up to here on the ducks. <laughs> you know, uncertainty is one of those things. We just don't always have um, a real grasp of what's taking place. Jennifer Williamson, in referring to several quotes, 15 uncertainty quotes that turn your worry into wonder, I, um, I saw this on HealingBrave.com, May of 25, 2018, and she, she just notes a few of them. I'm gonna write, just read a couple of them. Brene Brown, a lot of people know her. She, she had this comment, choosing to be curious is choosing to be vulnerable because it requires us to surrender to uncertainty. It wasn't always a choice. We were born curious. But over time, we learned that curiosity, like vulnerability, can lead to hurt. As a result, we turn to self-protecting, choosing certainty over curiosity, armor over vulnerability, and knowing over learning. Rune Lazuli said, it's not how we live in the light that enlightens us, it's how we live in the dark. And Bob Goff said, embrace uncertainty. Some of the most beautiful chapters in our lives won't have a title until much later. And Gilda Radner, an actress, had said this comment, I wanted a perfect ending. Now I've learned the hard way that some poems don't rhyme and some stories don't have a clear beginning, middle, and end. Life is about not knowing, having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what's going to happen next. She calls it delicious ambiguity. You know, in the last uh, few weeks, I've been listening to a lot of talk out there in media land that's been talking about pivoting and resetting. And a part of me is having a bit of problem with that. Now, I'm not a computer that I just go push a button and reboot and reset. I'm actually a human being that I take the experiences I've gained in life and hopefully I can use those things to maybe refocus, not necessarily reset, uh, plan new strategies. You know, we've, we've always been taught, you know, we want to be advancing technologically. We want to improve our learning skills. It's resets kind of like the last thing. And yet there's so many people using this and it's like, mm, what are you meaning by that? Is it, oh, we're resetting because it didn't go according to somebody's plan. Um, are we really advancing? Are we developing? Even in education, we're always looking at the, com the competencies of our students. Do you grasp what's going on? Do you understand it? Can you manage it? Can you explain it? Can you progressively grow in your learning and understanding? And I think that sometimes that reset is like, I just want to give up and we'll just boot it back to where it was and hopefully we'll do it better next time. Instead of going, well, perhaps we need to re-strategize and look at, yeah, it's uncertain. We don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to try this. And you know, it's okay to fail. Sometimes when we fail, we figure out better ways of doing something. So I, I'm kind of concerned about we're hearing all these little words out there, but who's generating the thoughts and what's their purpose in those thoughts? Are they really looking at the, the picture of growth and advancement and development? Or is it just like, well, we didn't work at this time, we'll just reset. I just want to challenge us to think that through a little bit. You know, there's a, another story I came across. It was a farmer whose only horse ran away. That evening, the neighbors gathered to commiserate with him since this was such bad luck. Your farm will suffer and you cannot plow, they said. Surely this is a terrible thing to have happened to you. He said, maybe yes, maybe no. The next day the horse returned but brought with it six wild horses and the neighbors came to congratulate him and exclaim at his good fortune. You are richer than you were before, they said. Surely this has turned out to be a good thing for you after all. He said, maybe yes, maybe no. And then the following day, his son tried to saddle and ride one of the wild horses. He was thrown and broke his leg, and he couldn't work on the farm. Again, the neighbors came to offer their sympathy for the incident. There is more work than only you can handle, and you may be driven poor, they said. Surely this is a terrible misfortune. The old farmer said, maybe yes, maybe no. The day after that, conscription officers came to the village to seize young men for the army. But because of his broken leg, the farmer's son was rejected. When the neighbors came again, they said, how fortunate, things have worked out after all. Most young men never returned alive after the war. Surely this is the best of fortunes for you. And the old man said again, maybe yes, maybe no. The truth is life is full of uncertainty, things that we cannot control, things that we have no say in. And sometimes you roll with the punches and learn through the experience that you go through that this will build resolve.
This will build strength. This will build new chapters, new opportunities in life to look at things differently. A lot of people will have their opinion around you. In fact, we wrestle with our own opinion. But that uncertainty, if it's not bridled and checked in our life, can almost drive us to the point of despair and become so worried about things that it locks us down to prevent us from moving forward. I love the chapter of Acts in verse in chapter 27 that talks about the account of um, Paul and he was on his way to Rome. He had appealed that Caesar would listen to his case. And as they were heading out, they got on the ship and they ran into bad weather. And, and Paul warned the, the centurion and those that were involved with the ship. He said, this voyage is going to be disastrous. But the centurion followed the advice of the pilot, the owner of the ship. And I know that, you know, hey, the, the owner of the ship should have a better grasp than you. But um, Paul was also expressing his concerns. And the reason why is the Holy Spirit was warning him of the disaster that was about to come. They sailed into hurricane four storms and um, they had to begin to throw over the cargo, all that precious commodity that they had hoped to sail and sell it when they arrived in their ports. Uh, they got caught in that storm for several days. In fact, it got to the point, it tells us, that they gave up hope of being saved. And then in verse 23 of that chapter 27, it says, last night an angel of the, of the God who, whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, man, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Fourteen days into this whole storm, they became close to land, and as they were checking out the possibility of going in there, even in this huge storm, some of the soldiers decided that they would let down a lifeboat and escape to land. Paul warned them. He said, if you do that, none of us will be saved. They stayed on board. They cut that lifeboat. Now, that doesn't make sense logically, does it? Most people think, well, let's get to shore. Let's get as many as possibly we can. The next morning, Paul urged them to eat, and he gave thanks to God. And on that, on that ship, that it tells us there was 276 lives. They decided to make a run for the beach. They saw it clear open. It was a sandy beach that went, went for a run for it, but they got stuck on a sandbar. <clears throat> and as they got stuck into that sandbar, the bow got lodged in and the pounding surf behind started to smash the ship and it started to break up. So at that point, the soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners so that none would escape. But the centurion, because he had found favor in the relationship that he had with, uh, with Paul and, and believed that Paul had a word from God, basically, I believe. He prevented their plan and all made it to shore. And then it goes into chapter 28, and it says that the islanders there welcomed them. They built a big fire, keeping them warm. But during that process, Paul had put his hand towards the fire, and a viper struck his hand, and it latched on. And the villagers watched that, and they thought, oh, you know, here's punishment. He didn't, he didn't die out at sea, but he's going to die here. And Paul shook off the viper and he just carried on and they were just amazed. They went, this man must be a God. That opportunity of that whole uncertainty involved into a very interesting thing because we find that after that event of the shipwreck and having that viper attach himself and having no harm come to Paul, that the, that the chief official of the island uh, approached Paul and his father was very, very ill. So Paul went over, prayed for him, and the man was healed. And what that uncertainty of that event led to is that others from the island came and they were prayed for, and the Bible says that they were healed. Who would have thought that in a storm, a shipwreck, when things seemed to be disastrous, God would show up and God would start to heal people. And, and Paul, despite the fact that he was going off to appeal his case before Caesar in the court of men, Paul had favor in the court of God, and he was doing what God wanted to do. And as he was in that place, in that place of uncertainty, Paul kept on doing what he had been doing for, for months and years. He kept on serving God. He kept on touching people's lives. He kept on praying for people, and people were healed. I just want to challenge us. You know, just because there's uncertainty in the world doesn't mean that we stop 
our race and, and our living for God and doing the things that God calls us to do. Live for him. Do what we can. Touch people's lives. So when it comes to dealing with uncertainty, I found this in leadmen.org. Their article was in March of 16, March 16 of this year. A couple of things they said. First, remember God's faithfulness. If we look at the life of Abraham, Abraham, his senior years into his 70s, was asked by God, come, I'm going to take you into a promised land. So everything that he knew and everything that had been developed in his life and his family and all the things that he did, Abraham got up and he moved and followed God. We need to remember God's faithfulness in our life, in our past. Just because some situations come our way that we cannot control does not mean that God abandons us, that God forgets us. But in fact, those are the opportunities where we press into him, where we trust him, where we learn to walk after his heart and to ask for his support and strength in our lives. Secondly, remember God is working even when we can't see it. You know, there's a lot of times when it comes to our walk with God and our faith experience, there's days where we don't understand the things that are happening or the way they're going. And sometimes we don't always see really maybe the things we anticipate God is doing. But again, God has not necessarily have to tell us um, his agenda in our lives, but he is still working in our lives. We need to thoroughly remember, remember that God provides for all of his creation. Every day, God looks after this world. Every day, uh, rain falls. There's, there's, there's all kinds of things that God does in allowing our world to continue day by day, and his provision is for all creation. And fourthly, most importantly, is remember God has provided a secure eternal future. This life is temporary. The future, our eternal life, is secured because of Jesus dying on the cross and forgiving us our sins when we call out to him in repentance and say, I recognize your God. I recognize you're a savior. You came to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. And at that moment, we are promised by God himself that we will have eternal life because we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for our salvation. Christine Carter, in July 27th of this year, in Greater Good Berkeley Education, she said there are seven ways to cope with uncertainty. One, don't resist. And she knows that what we resist often persists. It's better to have an acceptance of the moment as it allows us to be free to move upwards and move forward. It gives us a chance to strategize so if we just stick in our place of resistance, we, we don't become creative in our ability to think, well, how can I strategize a better way of doing something to change things? Secondly, invest in yourself. Take time for self-care and personal growth. You know, during the time of the pandemic here that's been happening all over the world, there's been people that have been actually doing some self-development, self-growth, self-care and uh, have been improving their life even despite what is happening with COVID. Thirdly, find healthy comfort items, not social media, junk food or booze or, or drug of choice. Maybe go for a hike, do things that you wanna do with uh, maybe friends, you know, have social distancing, wear your mask, do what you need to do at this time. Uh, but think on things that you're grateful for rather than just all is doom and gloom. You know, if you get into that state over and over, hour after hour in the course of the day, it's going to defeat you. But find some healthy comfort items. You know, chips and pop and junk food is not going to be the solution to a lot of those moments of frustration. Uh, what are better choices is basically what, what the author is suggesting. Fourthly, don't believe everything you think. And if you're like me, like everybody else I know of, there's lots of times we think about something and then our mind goes over to some extreme and says, oh, what if this happens or perhaps that? And, and then you build up this worry and this fear. Well, it's better to stay grounded and to think on things that are good, pure, lovely, of good report. Fifthly, pay attention and attend to what is current. That allows you to basically cultivate a calming effect and a non-reactivity uh, that just like a knee-jerk response. You have a chance to say, hey, let's stay present. What's going on here? What do we do? How do we deal with this? Sixthly, stop looking for someone to rescue you. Hmm. 
this act of powerlessness, actually, it, pre it starts to develop a tendency to become angry, helpless, and trapped. We're not powerless. We may have some constrictions on us right now because of the uncertainty of what can be done with COVID-19 and treatment and all those kind of things. But we don't have to act powerless. We don't have to become angry and, and helpless and, and stay trapped. Um, a lot of times when people stay in that place, they avoid taking responsibility. And we need to really own up to what we need to take responsibility for and get out of that routine of complaining. You know, it's real easy to complain, isn't it? Seventhly, find meaning in the chaos. The truth is we're best motivated by our significance to others. When we find meaning and purpose, we discover that they become wellsprings of hope. I've been kind of thinking in the last little while about the fact of even as churches, we haven't been able to function as we would typically do, especially this time of the season. A lot of times we are preparing Christmas hampers, we're helping people in need, we're, we're making ways of making life a little bit easier during the Christmas season for many people. A lot of people are locked in, a lot of people can't do what they have done in the past. Some of our elderly are limited due to some of their health conditions and uh, just being locked in and they're lonely. And it's kind of like, well, how do you figure out ways in order to make a difference? One of the things that she is saying here, finding meaning in the chaos is finding that what is the significance? You know, how can we how can we bless others? How can we touch their lives in some capacity? You know, the Bible says a lot of good things about dealing with uncertainty. Jeremiah 29, 11 reminds us, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, I know there's a lot of people who focus on the prosperity idea here, but the whole picture is God wants to care for our whole well-being. Giving hope in a future is tremendous. You can have all the wealth in the world, but if you have no hope, if you have no future, what is your wealth going to do? Even the Bible says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? It still comes back to that dynamic of having relationship with God, having meaning in life with God. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. See, God cares about us and he wants to see good things happen in our lives. He wants to instruct us. He wants to teach us. He wants to help us in the path where we should go. Proverbs 23, 17 to 18. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you and your hope will not be cut off. Isaiah 43, 2 is a scripture that I've often held in my life. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Now, there's not only the physical description here, but the, the idea here is also the spiritual care of God, the, the walking through those things with us. We don't always see the purposes and the plans, and life is often full of uncertainty, but God promises he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Matthew 6, 31 to 33 says, so do, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But first seek his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. God is interested in our well-being, And I wanna encourage you this morning to hold on to the fact that even though your life and the world around you may be very uncertain at times, God is not out of control. If you surrender his, his, your life to him and ask him to give direction, it may not me, mean that immediately overnight everything is fantastic, but that surrender and submission to God and his acts in your life is amazing how sometimes he'll start to steer things and begin to give you a, a clear way and a clear path. God is for us. And this morning as we just close, I just want to reassure you that even though things are chaotic around us, God is still in control. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I pray that you would find our lives today before you in places where we need you more than ever. I pray that you would help us to put our trust and confidence in you, that we would be able to see your hand in the storms of life, and the uncertainties that we deal with. 
Give us your peace today. Help us, Lord, to put our trust and confidence in you. You've told us in your word not to put our trust in kings and princes or in men, but to put our confidence in you. And so we ask you, help us to do that, Lord. Help us to learn that even when things are uncertain, you can still make our path straight. You can still illuminate the way. And more than that, you give us a future and a hope. We thank you for this today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week as we step into December. Praying for you.